Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about Erickson's psychosocial stages of development. And then I'm also going to talk about attachment theory and the importance of attachment um, to healthy development. So Erickson was a psychologist that really focused on psychological development and social development. So Piaget was really looking at um, our cognitive development, our uh, way our thinking changes as as we get as children grow. Whereas Erickson was really looking out through the throughout the whole lifespan as well, but he was also looking at psychological and social development. So he came up with eight stages of what he called psychosocial development, and it begins in infancy and ends in old age. So each stage he felt presented the person with a particular developmental task. So he called it a crisis sometimes, but really I think if we look at it as a developmental task um, that that person or child needs to complete in order to to grow up in a healthy psychological way. So each stage must be handled successfully for healthy psychological growth. And if the stage is not successfully resolved, the person's gonna have problems at the next stage and throughout their adulthood as well. He felt like the primary goal of childhood is developing a positive sense of yourself. And if you didn't do that, then you're gonna have struggles throughout your life, which I think is definitely true. Um, so these are his eight stages of psychosocial development. And it begins way down here at the bottom in infancy. Um, and the first stage is trust versus mistrust. So an infant must learn that they can trust their caregivers, that if they cry, somebody will come and help them. If they're hungry, somebody will feed them. And if a child doesn't have consistent parenting or consistent care, they can develop a sense of mistrust of their world and of their environment, and that can carry them throughout their entire life, right? Um, so that's really a very important stage. It seems very simple, but Erickson recognized the importance of attachment and developing a trusting relationship with your caregivers. Um, the second stage is those toddler years, autonomy versus shame and doubt. You know, so do, does the kid child learn to be independent? It, are they praised for being independent? Are they punished or shamed for being independent or for making a mistake. Um, the, the third stage is preschool age and it's initiative versus guilt. So, um, you know, does the person feel capable? Do they feel confident? Do they feel like if I try something, I'll be able to do it? Or should I just not do it? Or should I, you know, or do I feel guilty that I can't do it? The next one is industry versus inferiority. And this is the grade school years. And this is where kids kind of decide whether they're good at math or not, whether they're good at school or not, whether they're good at sports or not, maybe. Um, <clears throat> you know, so, the, you know, they kind of decide what they're good at, what they're not good at. And that, of course, can follow you throughout your whole life. If you decide in second grade you're not good at math or you're not good at sports, you're not going to do that for the rest of your life. Um, the next stage is your teen teenage years. And this makes a lot of sense. Identity versus role confusion. And certainly lots of teenagers are exploring all sorts of identities and seem a little bit confused at times. So they have to resolve that by the end of the teen years and figure out who they are, who they want to be, what they stand for, what their um, values are, what their morals are. All those kinds of things are really important things to resolve in adolescence. And then young adult stage, which is where many of you might be, is intimacy versus isolation, which is an interesting thing when what he's talking about is um, do you develop romantic relationships, close relationships? And he wasn't just talking romantic relationships, and he wasn't just talking heterosexual relationships either, just a strong romantic connection with somebody else. Um, and also intimate friendships as well, where you can share really who you are as a person um, and feel comfortable with another person and felt that that was really important to healthy psychological growth, which I would agree. And then as you get into your middle adult years, your 50s and your 60s, you know, generativity versus stagnation. Do you just sort of write out your career and sort of keep doing the same thing over and over again? Or do you reinvent yourself or do you try something new? Um, you know, do you um, try out um, new technology? You know, my mom is in her 70s, mid 70s, and she doesn't know how to use a cell phone. She hasn't really, um, she's kind of gotten stagnant at that stage. Whereas my husband's grandmother, who just died at 100, knew how to use a cell phone, knew how to use a computer, really kept on top of that technology. And so she was definitely, um, 
you know, up with the times. And I think that helped her to live to be a hundred as well. So, but at that stage, you kind of have to figure out, you know, do I want to reinvent myself or do I just kind of want to coast along the rest of life? And at the very last stage, when you're in your later years, and you guys, if you have older family members might have noticed this, do you feel like you've lived a good life? Do you feel like you've done the things that you wanted? Or do you feel pretty bad that, um, you know, you, you you screwed up some things in your life. Um, and so a lot of people are struggling with that at those ages. So that's Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. Um, and now we're going to move on to theories of attachment. So Erickson recognized the importance of attachment. And that first stage of trust versus mistrust has a lot to do with attachment. So attachment is absolutely important to healthy psychological development. And it can be attachment to any caregiver. It can be to mom, to dad, um, you know, to grandma, grandpa, um, any of the family members or people that care for that child. And it doesn't have to be just one person. It can be multiple, lots of people that that child develops a healthy attachment to and feels like that's a person or someone that they can trust and that cares for them. Um, John Bowlby was the first psychologist to actually study attachment. And he said basically that an infant must bond with their primary caregiver in order to have normal social and emotional development. And notice he says primary caregiver. So he's not uh, saying it has to be a mother or a father. And, you know, it could be an adoptive parent. Um, so it's just that you have to have a bond with somebody, at least one person, um, if not more. And Henry Harlow, Henry and Margaret Harlow, Harlow did some awful experiments with these poor baby monkeys back in the 1950s at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and um, their theory was that infants only attach to their mothers because they provide food. And so they wanted to test this theory. And so what they did was they made these weird looking um, monkeys. So this um, that acted kind of as a surrogate mom to these little baby monkeys. So they had a cloth monkey that had a soft blanket on them and um, did not give the monkey any food at all. And then they had a wire monkey that didn't have any softness or nurturing about it, but it did actually have food. And so what they wanted to do is find out how much time would the baby monkeys spend with cuddling with that soft monkey and how much time would they spend with the monkey that provided them food. And their experiment showed that the monkeys, the baby monkeys, spent majority of their time with the cloth monkey and trying to connect. It was kind of sad. You'll see the video um, of this um, the experiment. Um, it's not an experiment that we would do today. Um, definitely many monkeys were harmed in this study. And... Um, it seems strange to us now that we would even need to prove this theory, but at the time it seemed like a pretty important question. Um, and what they actually discovered was that um, not only did these baby monkeys prefer the cloth monkey, they preferred it even to food. So they would go and when they got hungry and eat with the wire monkey, but they spent the majority of their time cuddling with the cloth monkey. And so what they found was that um, attachment and that cuddling was much more important than um, the food itself. Um, this little monkey here is really sad. Um, and this little monkey didn't have either the wire monkey or the cloth monkey. And, you know, you imagine that these poor little monkeys growing up with the wire monkey and the cloth monkey did not grow up in a normal way and probably were disordered, dysfunctional in some ways as well. But at least they had that cloth monkey. This little monkey had none of that and just spent its days sort of rocking back and forth, um, in a cage and was very disordered and very sad. Um, and you know, you th think about that, you do see some kids with developmental delays that do a lot of rocking and things like that. And it, they do it because it's a comforting thing. You'll see that with Jeannie Wiley a little bit in her video as well. It's worth watching this video. It'll, it, yeah, you'll, you'll remember it for a while, I guess. Um, but they really did prove the importance of attachment to healthy development, healthy psychological development, just healthy de uh, development in general. So, and you know, we kind of know this already that attachment absolutely affects your adulthood. And kids that didn't have consistent care, can they become healthy, well-adjusted adults? 
Probably not. This is Charlie Manson. I don't know if you guys remember much about him, um, but he had a horrific childhood. He was very abused. Um, his mother was in and out of prison, um, and he was kind of raised by a sadistic uncle that told him, you know, if you're going to act like a girl, you're going to dress like a girl and would make him go to school in a dress and things like that. And this is the kid that uh, did the GTA murders. Um, he was in foster care and just bounced around a lot in his life and really didn't have anybody that cared for him or paid attention to him. So absolutely not having a, a strong attachment to anyone can be really damaging um, to your psychological health as an adult. So Mary Ainsworth kind of wanted to understand not only attachment, but, you know, are there different types of attachment or some attachments that are better than others? So she described attachment as the degree to which an infant feels an emotional connection with their primary caregivers. Her research was done kind of in the 60s or so. You can kind of tell by the clothes and stuff here. So she came up with four different types of attachment, a secure attachment, with is a, which is a healthy attachment, a resistant attachment, an avoidant dis attachment, and a disorganized attachment. We're going to talk about each of these a little bit. But she said that a secure attachment is essential to healthy physical and psychological development. So she developed this um, strange situation study, and I'll put a video in there for you, but what it was was she um, would have the mom and that baby come into the room with her and the baby was playing with toys and you know relaxing and then the mom would get up and leave the room for a few minutes and um, what Mary Ainsworth was studying was how did that infant respond when the mom left were they upset were they soothed and how did they respond when mom came back were they soothed when mom came back did they calm down were they still mad you know and so what she said was that babies that appear to have a secure attachment will definitely be upset when moms leaves, but they're really soothed when mom comes back. They feel like mom is a safe home base. The insecurely attached kids, there's three different types that she came up with, which I kind of spelled out a little bit before, are ones that are in, have an increased re risk for social and emotional problems. So a resistant attachment, this the child is upset when mom leaves, but not soothed when mom, mom returns. And it's probably caused by inconsistent responsiveness to the child. Um, and the mom could be depressed or uh, postpartum depression, using drugs or alcohol, all sorts of things. So it's, mom's just not consistent um, in being there for the child. So the child doesn't really feel soothed by mom's present in a resistant attachment. Avoidant, the baby doesn't even seem distressed when mom leaves and doesn't seem to care when mom comes back. So there's really doesn't seem to be an emotional connection there. And that's when mom really doesn't respond to the child's needs at all. So that's an avoidant attachment. And then a disorganized attachment is the worst kind. Avoidant is definitely bad. Um, resistant is not quite as bad as the disorganized, but it's the most severe form where the mother is just not seen as a comfort to the child at all. Um, it's seen in really high risk families. 80% of the kids with this attachment style have been physically abused or maltreated. So it's really um, interesting that at this early of an age, we can really, and, and this was at 12 to 18 months, and that's around the age where separation anxiety usually starts as well. Um, and, um, you know, the quality of the attachment is already, you know, something we can uh, assess and understand at that very young age. So there are some questions about her study. You know, we, you know, putting kids in distress for research pur purposes, considered unethical today. We wouldn't necessarily do this experiment again. Um, but she did really show the importance of sensitive and responsive parenting to a healthy chat attachment um, and certainly to a healthy um, adulthood as well. Um, and atta your attachment style as an infant also affects your ability to attach to a romantic partner, even friendships as a, a you know, older child, a teenager, and as an adult as well. Um, so it was groundbreaking research. It's just, um, 
you know, just the way the research was done is a little questionable. So what about attachment styles and relationships? I kind of mentioned that. So the quality of your parent-child relationship growing up actually predicts the quality of your romantic relationships later on in life and your adult attachment style. So parents who had a secure attachment are more likely to develop a secure attachment with their own children and also with romantic partners. Um, definitely healthy attachments are related to well-being and physical and mental health later on in life. So that's it about attachment.